Metabolism shouldn't be scary, and it's a lot less scary if you think about what everything has in common as opposed to what these pathways are all having differently. One of the things that they have in common is the idea of reaction coupling and having some reactions that are kind of like near equilibrium and some that are what we call like far from equilibrium so that we are able to re control the direction of the reaction as well as have sort of non go non go points to make whole pathways either go or not go. And often this is going to be using ATP, so let's review all these things. Some reactions are going to be inherently energetically unfavorable. They'll have a positive delta G naught prime, which remember is going to be saying, like if we were to start with standard conditions, so we have one molar, we have equal concentrations of our products and reactants, and we let, take, let them go to equilibrium, Assuming that we have enough long enough time to wait, we come back, we'll find more of our products than reactants if it's favorable, or we'll find more of our reactants than products if it's unfavorable. So in the case of an unfavorable reaction, we'd find more of our reactants than our products. But what if we want to form those products? Well, we could stock up on more of the reactants, use the Chatelier's principle to drive things to the right, but then we're going to do a couple things. One is we're going to make it even harder to go in the reverse direction, because if you make the forward direction more favorable, you're also making the reverse direction harder. And then you could have crazy concentrations of things, and it still might not even be enough to get over that bump. Now, enzymes can only do so much because they're going to catalyze the forward and the reverse directions. They can lower the activation barrier, but they can't change the difference in free energy between your starting and your finishing products, the delta G naught prime. That, um, and so basically what's going to happen, though, is that because the delta G naught prime, because the overall change in free energy is going to be a state function, what you can do is you can actually couple reactions together. So you could take a non-favorable reaction and couple it to a favorable reaction. And as long as that favorable reaction has enough energy to that you need for the unfavorable one, they share a common intermediate, you can combine them in order to use the energy from the favorable reaction to power the unfavorable reaction. Now, sometimes what we want to do is we want to have reactions that are going to be very energetically favorable, so energetically favorable that it's basically irreversible. So although nothing is actually technically irreversible, there are some reactions that we consider basically irreversible because the change of free energy is so great that you can't really easily go backwards. And so we're going to see a few examples of these, which are going to serve as important like regulatory points um, through metabolic pathways, because you can imagine that if you can control those like go or no go points, those points of no return, well, then you can basically control the whole thing. But what can happen then is that you're making it harder to go in reverse. So typically what we're going to see with metabolic pathways is that there are often going to be steps that a lot of steps that are reversible, steps that have like similar, um, that are running at like near equilibrium conditions. Under these conditions, small changes in the concentration of your reactants or your products can lead to like what direction things are going to go. Because remember that the actual J of reaction goes doesn't just depend on that delta G naught prime, it depends on the actual concentrations the comparison between our KEQ, so our equilibrium concentration ratio, and the actual ratio at the present moment, the Q. And so if you have a Q that is less than your KEQ, then you need to make more products. But if you have a Q that's going to be greater than your KEQ, you're going to go backwards to reactants. And so by controlling the levels of the reactants and products, you can control the direction of the reaction but it still has to be able to overcome that delta G naught prime. And so by having reactions that are kind of running closer to that tipping point, you're able to go back and forth easily. And then by having these reactions that are running far from equilibrium, you can have a go or no go point. And then if we want to go backwards, so if we want to, instead of doing glycolysis, breaking down sugar, we want to do gluconeogenesis, go the other direction, then we'll take a different route of the, to go over those steps with those big change in free energy. But for these other steps, we can more easily go back and forth between them. And we can do that by changing the levels of our reactants and our products. But if we want those big changes in free energy, 
And if we need to do something that's really energetically unfavorable, typically what we're going to do is we're going to turn to ATP or we're going to turn to some other quote unquote high energy compound. Remember that it's not the actual breaking of the ATP that is causing this energetic boost. It's always, always, always going to be endergonic. You're going to have to put in a little energy in order to break a bond. Because remember that whole enthalpy, enthalpy thing where we're going to get energy if we make a bond. So we have to make use energy to break a bond. But then we get bonds to water with hydration. We get things like resonance stabilization. So there are ways in which this ATP is, a, is like using this ATP is going to be inherently favorable. But typically we're not just like burning it right as is. Instead, we're transferring ATP. So we can transfer from either of the three phosphate positions, and this is going to allow us to have a nice leaving group. So we, we're going to see it activate various parts of reactions, make great leaving groups for when we do our SN2 type reactions. And so we're going to see a lot of examples of this when we talk about different metabolic pathways. And I don't want you to get tied up in trying to memorize all of these pathways or all these intermediates, but I do want you to kind of take a look and see how the phosphate groups and how similar things are being used in order to facilitate reactions. But remember that the big power of ATP isn't just from that inherent favorability, it's also from the fact that we keep its concentrations so out of skew, so that we have a, such a higher concentration of our ATP compared to our ADP and our AMP and stuff, and this is going to then allow it to have a higher potency. We can also monitor the ratio of AMP and ATP in order to have an idea, get a sense of how, how things are going in a cell. Do we have more energy? Do we need more energy? And then by using ATP, not only as an energy source, but also as a regulatory molecule, by having things like phosphorylation control the activity of enzymes, by having ATP and AMP and ADP act to allosterically modify various enzymes, we have all these ways where we can use ATP and other ways in order to control things like the making of more ATP. And so remember that metabolism, it's not just these straight arrows. It's not simple pathways. Instead, what we're going to have is we're going to have that complex system where things are going in all sorts of directions and it can get really overwhelming, but you shouldn't try to memorize things. Instead, we're just going to kind of look at the connections, look at what's happening, look at the logic. And that's what I really care about you guys focusing on is not trying to memorize all those pathways. Please, please, please don't try to memorize all those pathways. Instead, let's think about the logic. Because if you can understand that logic, well, then you can apply it to all these different pathways.